I have not had time to read all the emails that have come in in the last hour. Um, but Maria, you sent one that said, we've got a little constitutional issue, so we should probably deal with that one. Well, you do, and um, depending on where you wanna go. So uh, as you know, legislative committees don't have legislative authority. Right. Um, the Joint Fiscal Committee, and in some instances, the Emergency Board in very limited instances, during the interim has some authority to reallocate funding. Um, I don't know the exact amount. Um, basically to respond to needs that come up while the full session, the full body is not in session, right? So I had done I have done some uh, further research. I didn't know if that interim authority had been expanded at all. Um, because of the public health emergencies. And what I mean is with respect to waiving program requirements, not just limited reallocations of funds. Um, and so, but the short answer is no, there is no, they do not have that authority. Um, and nobody else has suggested that they should have that authority. Um, so I, I think that that is a real, um, constitutionally problematic area. If under the proposal that, you know, one of the suggestions was that, you know, maybe the oversight committees, whether it's JITOC or the standing committees, you know, make a recommendation to the joint fiscal committee or the emergency board to kind of waive the speed requirements if it became apparent that um, other projects would be more successful to reach uh, so anyway, the short answer is that would need to be done legislatively. So if you're back in August. Okay. That this has to do with the authority to waive the requirements? Yes. Okay. Not with the authority to, if we haven't spent all the money, to send it back or recommend that it get reallocated. Sure, you can make those recommendations, absolutely. Um, probably to the emergency board, that seems to be, as you know, the governor's on the emergency board. Yeah, but that, it doesn't. To, to, to it waive which requirements? Like twice a year. Uh, to waive uh, which requirements are we discussing? This is money, right? So, right. So the commissioner is going to be reporting to Jai Talk and this committee and House Energy monthly on the program's implementation, the funds that are going out, the funds that remain, plans going forward. So the question is, based on that information, uh, would you want to make recommendations to either the emergency board or the joint fiscal committee about potential reallocations of funding? Um, okay, let's kick that can. It looks, well, this is, if my, we'll know in September how the money's going out. This says the drop debt date is the end of October. If there isn't reasonable expectation that the money's going out, then this committee could recommend that the Appropriations Committee reallocate it. Can we do that? And if it looks like we're not going to be here in the end of October, which may be possible, then we will, we can deal with it then. And uh, depending on how it's going, we can make the recommendation at that time. Uh, that appropriations reallocate. And just to be perfectly clear, I didn't, I did not specify October. Um, you know, this just has uh, any recommendations, you're getting monthly reports, and you can make those recommendations at any time. Okay. Uh, the only kind of drop dead date is the December 20th. Any unexpended funds revert to the state 
Coronavirus. Yeah, and I and we talked about moving that back because okay. there's nobody meeting on our no December twentieth, right? December twentieth, and the I guess the only consideration there is if uh, the commissioner. So this would be money that's still in the program and yeah. available for the commissioner to um, disperse you know, based on the contracts with providers. So she may be retaining some of that. I, I don't know if it's not already. Yeah. Let's, project, then maybe well, you want. December 20th. I mean, what we don't want to do is send money back to the feds. So any unexpended funds to think that the Appropriations Committee is going to be meeting on December 20th to send those funds to the UI fund. So maybe it's best to put in here that any funds unexpended by December 20th will automatically go to the UI fund and if appropriations wants to change that, let them. Yeah, and just I'll just say one more thing. The that reversion language um, exists as standard administrative provisions in all of this the CRF appropriations. So even if you that will be included. Um, okay. So in we'll let, let's let appropriations deal with that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we're back to if this money is not going out the door anywhere, any way near the speed that we hope it will, when do we pull the plug and tell the Appropriations Committee, you might want to take a look at reappropriating this? And I think October, you know, the end of October. would be a would be the drop dead date you're not going to do some you know get a grant october 30th and have somebody connected up given vermont weather by christmas it's i mean they're telling us you need six months is what they said yesterday so we're cutting this really close we could probably pull the plug in mid-october so perhaps just saying that money um, for now, saying any money not expended by the October report from the commissioner, the Committee on Finance will consider, or the, why don't we just say the Appropriations Committee can consider reallocating. So I guess I just wonder Oops. that, um, you won't be in session then. And well, I don't know that they... some people think we will. Okay. <laughs> could That's we what say, we don't know. Could All we right, say then. any money not spent or, uh, you know, uh, at, um, what's the right word? Committed. Accounted for. Um, and then could we maybe in this case, this is unusual compared to all the business support. Could we empower joint fiscal or somebody, you know, some so-and-so may decide to revert this to ACCD or something? Yeah, the only power joint fiscal has is to approve grants. Now we're approving all the administration's expenditures under the CR CARES funds because they are federal grants. This is also a federal grant. So we could um, consider that's I, that's something we need legal counsel to check. But I, they, we joint fiscal is approving all grant expenditures yeah, up to two tranches. Uh, the third is going through the appropriations process. So 
yeah, we could return it to ACCD, then the administration could come to joint fiscal and ask for permission to expand. And I don't know who did that original drafting for joint fiscal, probably check with the joint fiscal committee if that's uh, acceptable. I can check with JFO. I know the language that I just found had was more specific to the emergency board having the authority between July 1st and September 30th to transfer appropriations. So I, I don't know what the, the right entity is, but I can ask yeah. JFO. I mean, the emergency board has the power and joint fiscal has the power and we're not in session to approve certain parameters yes. of money switching. Yes. I think emergency board has a higher parameter. Yeah. Um, and does include the governor. Yeah. My, but joint fiscal is basically charged with approving all, all grant acceptances. Yeah. And we have gotten agreement that in order to get us to the COVID, maybe because we've already approved accepting the COVID money. Yeah, because the rest is going through approves. Okay. We need, this is something, let's just send this to approves and ask them what they'd like us to do with it. I was going to say I can put placeholder language in there yeah. and just have, you know, I can, you know, this work isn't a it. bill. This is our recommendation yeah. to, uh, you know, the appropriations committee. Senator, you're bouncing all over the place. At one point, I had three Senator Pearsons on my screen. You are a lucky lady, Madam Chair. I guess I am. And <laughs> I don't have McDonald's cows. No peaceful thing here. I got to find don't, a teddy bear. World War okay. II up there. Yeah, uh, I thought that was, that was the pro Thames thing, right? Days since World War II or in World War II. We're not I'm, go I'm glad on. that he has ad adapted that. I'm only copying him, yes. You're only copying him. All right. So we will say that it is our intent that money that is not <clears throat> committed, that the Appropriations Committee consider reallocating it and let them deal with how they want to do that. Okay. All right. All right. Now, we've got, have we finished going through? Almost. This? Almost, okay. Let's finish going through it. Okay. Uh, so, draft oh, one. Oh, we got a third color. <laughs> I do have a third color, and actually, this is draft one point three. I think is what we're gonna say. All those colors are easier to look at than all the black and white. Right. So, just a couple of other changes have since have been added since we last spoke. But um, so the big issue that I think you wanted to work on is the specific limits. Yeah. Um within this umbrella fund, the 17 plus million dollars, um, which can go to the five kind of funding streams that are now, that you can see up on the screen, the line extension to get from Monarchs Connected Now, the potential lifeline program, the broad connectivity initiative, and then you already specify that up to 50,000 goes to Wi-Fi deployment. So I don't know exactly, you know, where you want to come down, but that's something that 
you wanted to, I think, consider and potentially fill in more specifically the amounts. But we'll just flag that. And, you know, there's just one change here. This was the issue that I had flagged earlier, you know, about the customer installations that are yeah. supported. You know, there's service drops, underground conduit to particular households or mobile home parks. They don't really fall within the connectivity initiative, which bases its um, grants on eligible census blocks and unserved areas. These are basically households within fiber network. So this is just meant to clarify that yes, the funds can go through the connectivity initiative, um, even in areas that are otherwise considered served. Okay, yeah. That's, so, okay. that's probably more, the more likely place people with some resources that, because I don't know how much of a line extension $3,000 is going to buy you. Right. Now, if I got three neighbors and we can go out, but this is all has to go to homes with kids, right? It's school kids is the first priority, then work from home. Right. Well, it's, it, that's and right. Then, and telehealth and, you know, right. I mean, it's even quite honestly, those are the three areas that most get emphasized. Right. But there are other public programs, um, obviously, access to uh, the UI system or the court system or public safety, you know, there, yeah. but, but you have to buy this, you know, I think with Senator Sorokin, find the farthest out person you can and bypass 20 houses and get it to that person right. might make us more subject to an audit if those 20 houses we bypassed were, I don't know, had no children in school, had nobody that was sick. Had, I mean, the more we can, that's why the clustered areas, the unserved areas are the yep. most important. This one, Yep. <laughs> I think we could say while priority should be given to underserved areas, um, yeah, mobile home parks are, I didn't realize they required underground. That's pretty expensive from people that live in a mobile home. So I say priority should be given to. May I ask you a quick question, Madam Chair? Yeah. I just want to go back to the prioritization. Did we, do we want to put uh, health over working from home? I mean, is it, is it, or is it just it's, sort of it, general? It, it's the federal, that's the federal guidelines. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, got well, it. Thanks. We can yeah. say, well, that, that's who they're targeting. And if we get called, we have to show so we're following the federal that guidelines. Okay. we are trying to follow federal guidelines. I think what we heard is because of federal privacy rules, we got four calls of people that needed hookup for telehealth. Um, and I gather that if we called the VNAs, even though they've been doing this stuff for years, they couldn't tell us that so and so and so and so are my client or our clients, and they need telehealth. They can contact in here their people and say, "You can do this." But so that one is harder. But we have pretty good and could probably, if this money starts going out, get a few school districts to come up with a better mapping of where they've got sections of students that need broadband um, or any connection. We've got some that have no connection. 
And just the line see. extension could be doing an entire town, I think. Could that, or is that, could the that go to- is really for, that's the- For an individual. The, the, a mile out of the town. Okay. Between one and 14 houses per mile, you know, that have not been able to afford the customer costs of the, that construction. So yeah. that's money that goes to the, the customer. So my neighborhood in Waterbury, 14 people could apply and probably come up. Yeah, would, but it's more, it's, it's not tied to being in an underserved area. It's tied to your underserved. You don't have a connection, even though your census block has a lot of connections. That, uh, that, that's right. That's right. It's a, it's a separate program. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. So the one for providers. I just wanted no, to make sure we. Yeah, we've got our own. It's all thrown in here, but providers is still lit. Is it? Have we limited this to fiber? The other, the house pretty much limited it. You couldn't do any cable connections. You were doing fiber do unless it was in line extension. For, for money to providers, um, that's true. Line extensions, as long as you provide a 25-3 service, again, that's assistance to the customer costs. For any other funds under their kind of expanded, well, not expanded, but funds, um, any other funds to providers were for uh, fiber to the premises, customer installations, and fixed wireless. Um, I don't think that the house was necessarily opposed to larger scale fiber deployments. I think they felt that that that, that was just it was not reasonable to anticipate that any yeah, of those. I don't think it is okay. Down. The so, house is still going to have to write off on this. How we're getting this done by tomorrow, I'm not sure, but we need to get it out of here. Um, okay, so that leaves us with the... Madam Chair, the, before we... Yeah. Uh, Maria, could you scroll backwards a little bit up? The, the yeah. Uh, there it is. The project designated to serve economically challenged communities. Uh, we did get an email that I thought was an interesting point that by hinging it to communities, um, that may look to census blocks um, where you may have on average not economically challenged block, but you know, pass by some economically challenged home. That's so I don't town. know, I don't know what, I think that was your language, uh, or something you were keyed into, Madam Chair, I wondered. Well, I think, I'm just trying to say, if you've got a wealthy community that, you know, we've got a few wealthier communities up in some underserved areas that have set themselves, have gotten a connection within their town, Craftsbury, Greensboro, Peachum, their neighboring towns. Well, Reedsboro have, isn't wealthy, but yeah, you know their neighboring towns or sections of their town aren't. But there's there's clusters. I'd rather. I don't know. It's communities. Why don't we just say areas? Or or even families. Okay. Yeah, families yeah, work. I would go with families. I agree. Okay, families works. Households, maybe? Yeah, households. Is households, great. So just to be clear that you, you, I think I heard two different things, but in terms of the fiber to prim customer installations, uh, where the line might be running by a low income household, that still exists. 
under that program. I think this is just a more of a general concern that there might actually be areas, um, whole areas where there could be build out, kind of the larger scale deployment, whether it's wired or wireless, um, that maybe there should be some direction to consider, you know, areas that might be more economically challenged. So yeah. I just wanted to clarify that that was that an attempt to address both scenarios. Yeah, I think I think that's it. it. You know that we we definitely saw clusters in the map yesterday, mostly in the kingdom. Some of those may go away as that northeast our northeast kingdom project goes through, but there definitely were clusters of areas where students did not have access to broadband. So. You know, we may not shut the economy down again if there's a flare up, but we might well shut schools down um, if the flare up starts hitting in the in the school areas. So, well, how about if we say households or communities, and that way we're we're yeah. right. giving them discretion, and yeah. we we cover our bases, but we're we're not hopefully getting ourselves in trouble. No, I think that's the purpose. Okay. Thank you. So I think we've got Michael. All right, take us through this and then we'll do. So I think I is subsection I, you've, you've spoken about, we'll, we'll come back to this so you can make your final decision. This is about the CUD input and whether it's veto authority or just like what is proposed here where it's something that, for the commissioner to consider. Madam that's Chair your final determination. Um, but Madam Chair, on yes. this point, I've just for the past uh, uh, 25 minutes been on the line with uh, Chairman Briglin of the House regarding some of these provisions, including this particular one. Okay. Uh, House has a proposal that would be acceptable to them to deal with this particular section. And that essentially is uh, for the uh, CUD to be informed <clears throat> uh, 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 immediately upon any application for service within their area, for the CUD to have one week, seven calendar days to raise an objection uh, okay. to the proposal. And then thereafter, as the commissioner uh, may override the, the CUD's objection, but, sim but is simply required to document in writing why. That would satisfy the House Committee. Great. That's out of doing that. All right. So can you send that to Maria? We can cut and paste it. Do you have it? I, I, I got to write it down. And it basically, it's exactly what I've said. But okay. Maria, I send you a note to that effect. No problem. No problem. I think okay. I got the gist of it. So I yep. can do that. Okay. Okay. That works. Um, I have one week, seven calendar days to raise an objection. The commissioner may override, but has to just document in writing why they've overridden it. Nothing more than okay. that. Okay, so I think in terms of the money that um, may be retained, I think you wanted to say that up to 40% may be retained. To make I raised sure. the 40% as an, as an issue uh, and you know whether it's something like 30 or 40, but the notion there is again, the small providers just did in fact have a concern as to whether or not they could get the capital necessary to do this. And if they don't have something like that, it might just make uh, the big guys, the only ones who can participate. And I think that's a valid concern. Well, and we're, we're now giving the commissioner permission, but she doesn't have to, but we're being, we're, we're doing our best to be protective of. Yeah. I mean, the what the commissioner said is the standard when you're dealing with the legacy providers is she doesn't pay them at all until the job's done. And where this one, you can't say, yeah, you can have two more weeks. Um, the more money that's out the door, the more money the state of Vermont is on the hook for. I would, I would, you know, want to give the commissioner discretion to provide material money or, you know, necessary money to get the job going 
but I don't want her now to have Comcast come in and say, well, geez, you've got to give us 60% when she didn't used to give them anything. Uh, so. Well, I guess you could have the, uh, uh, you could either limit it to uh, money for materials, which again, creates an accounting nightmare, or yeah. you could say that the commissioner may retain um, you know, may may disperse up to sixty percent of the funds upon justification by the provider uh, that a financial hardship or something like that requires such such action and reasonable expe expectation that the project will be <clears throat> completed. I mean, my concern is we get an ice storm in the end of October or November and nothing gets built. And I, I don't want to have us having tens of millions of dollars clawed back. Uh, I'm so sure the, the commissioner's on the, the call here and, and maybe between her I or Maria, we could understand is there, is this necessary? To, what kind of authority does the commissioner have in this area um, herself? After all, the whole administration is going to be keenly uh, worried about this basic question. Uh, that's a oh, commissioner. Oh, she is here. Yeah, okay. I have here. Yeah, that's a that's a very um, topical question. As you're aware, the administration has retained a consultant to advise on the appropriate use of the funds. And so my understanding is that there has to be some socialization within um, the framework that the administration has set up to ensure that uh, we're following the guidance that the consultants provide. So I would expect almost immediately to be getting a, you know, a, a query out to them to say, what is your view about what I can and cannot do here? So there, there will be another look at this in addition to what you folks are doing here. And I think the caution is, is well advised. But at the end of the day, um, there is going to have to be some risk taking if we're gonna get something done within the limited time frame that we have. So I think, you know, as I understand it, uh, you've prepared a, a mechanism whereby the department is regularly checking in with JITOC and you will have, um, you know, a fairly, it's not going to be real time, but there will be a regular check-in. And if you, if you see something concerning happening there, uh, there's an opportunity for you to, you know, to reach in and say, hey, um, we're concerned about the level of exposure that the state has at this point with the way you're using these dollars, Commissioner. But um, I'm, I'm hearing you loud and clear. And frankly, you're not saying anything today that I'm not already very concerned about. Uh, we, the, the, the fact of the matter is we are looking to move dollars through a loophole here. The treasury guidance allows us to do something for students, uh, telehealth to some extent too, even the guidance that came out overnight reaffirms that. But this clearly was not the, the thing that was primarily in mind building broadband infrastructure when these funds were released to the states. So there is an element of risk here that we are either gonna take or not take, that these projects get done. And for disbursement purposes, I'm, I'm happy to abide by a regimen where the bulk of the, the pay is not rendered until the project is done. But as you all have pointed out today, there are going to be participating entities that may find it hard to get going without the money up front or some part of the money up front. So I think that's gonna call for judgment and that's where uh, you can put me in the hot seat to do that or you can put strictures around it in statute and you know, we will do what we can within the confines of what you lay out. And beyond that, I don't think we're gonna get much more certainty. Do you have authority now under the connectivity fund to pay up front or pay at the end? What do you do? You, you... To my knowledge, um, and to my knowledge, there's nothing statutorily that prevents us from doing that. That has not been our practice. Our practice has been to 
put a, give them a certain amount up front and then to d disperse the rest well, of the grant once it has been um, confirmed. Um, I know Clay is on the line too, and so I'm happy yeah. to have him weigh on in on this. <clears throat> I don't believe. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I don't believe there's anything currently in the statute that would prevent us from paying some amount of money up front. Um, we've typically uh, not paid until the project is completed um, out of an abundance of caution. Could we just say at her discretion, um, I don't even know that we have to say after consultation, but there is a consultant there to make the sole purpose is to make sure that we don't, and that people that get money get to do the documentation so that they can justify it. But just give the commissioner discretion to, you know, say the, the, as a general rule, nothing gets paid until the project is done before the completion date. Um, F at her discretion, after I just say at her discretion, the um, commissioner may um, award a portion of that money. And I mean, 60% sounds high to me, but I don't know how much of it is labor and how much of it is um, equipment. And I guess it depends on the project too. But you know, when you're laying fiber and so on, I suspect a substantial portion of it is uh, is equipment cost. Can we say just say she may um, she made this a portion? Um, for necessary yeah, necessary equipment. Um, Commissioner? I think we could take this whole thing out and I was going to suggest that you might consider something along the lines of what Senator Brock was saying earlier instead of having this um, spelled out in this fashion um, put the responsibility on me to exercise judgment um, I in turn um, obtain certification this is what I would have done anyway if you had been silent on the topic I would inquire into the circumstances and obtain certification uh, from the provider as to the necessity of having any part of the funding dispersed up front. Because remember, we're, we're targeting two populations here. One is uh, the CUDs and the other is providers who are able to string um, fiber and the like. And so for that second group, they typically have the resources to do this work up front and get paid later. It's really the CUDs that you're concerned about. And I don't think it's gonna come as a surprise to anybody that the CUDs might not have the requisite capital up front to get the job done. What the concern has to be is whether they're actually gonna be able to finish the job uh, within the time frame. that's the risk we're gonna to have to take. And if I've at least obtained a certification from them as to why they say they need the money, that's reviewable, especially if that's being reported to JITOC. And if uh, they see something there that looks like it's going off the rails, they can rein me in. Yeah, the, all right. I'm, I'm, Maria's telling us what we're saying. Um, so yeah, but the commissioner made the disperse an award for upfront capital costs, providing determined such funding is necessary and does not unduly, somewhere we should say, I think we'll do it because I don't think your job approval rating would go up very much if a bunch of these had to get clawed back. Well, I think it's your boss so might poor. be a little upset. <laughs> um, 
So, but just say that, you know, in dispersing, the, the general principle is things don't get um, paid for until they're up and running, that under limited circumstances, the commissioner can award a portion up front, um, provided she's taking all due precautions to make sure to, you know, to limit the state's exposure to clawback. I think you had it there, Maria, before. I, I don't know that we need limited. I can't look at you. Read Maria. I, I, I don't think we need to say under limited circumstances. If we're saying the commissioner may disperse an award for upfront capital costs provided commissioner determines such funding is necessary for project commencement. That's... That seems to be what we're saying. Yeah, that's what we're saying. Um, so uh, then now we're not fiddling with 60% or 40% or any of that. That's fine. The only question is whether or not we can make it clear that that it is based upon application uh, by the, 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 the potential uh, whatever. Yeah. And presumably it would be. The commissioner's not going to read one pager and dole out two million dollars this is going to be there will be some back and forth there will be some kind of application that will make it clear i mean i don't think we need to worry about that in page five of our bill i think she's gotten the message that if we start letting comcast Correct. get their money up front we're not going to be happy um and yeah, uh, unless, you know, they have to dynamite through a hill or something. But um, yeah, that this is really meant to help the CUDs or maybe there's another small contractor, you know, like we've got up in the kingdom that exactly. said, you know, we could do it, but... And we got the trucks and we got the, the personnel, but we don't have the money to buy the material. Anytime I've had work done in my home, I have to pay for the material up front. Seems that people are inclined to stick contractors. So um, yeah, that, I, I think that'll do it. Um, up front, a good word for a bill. Up Effective front, advance <laughs> payment for capital costs necessary. Yeah, might be. advanced uh, payment, something like that. Yeah, we got a long way to go here. Yeah, we do, and we're supposed to have had that. I'm waiting. I'm keep watching for the email from Jane saying, "Where is it?" And Madam Chair, I don't, uh, I just quickly, I, you probably heard from the corner office, but uh, they're hoping for us to at least look at whether or not we want to take the Abenaki bill in because that's uh, something important. Well, I got an e I got a phone call in the middle of the last session of this committee telling me they were going to take it up. Why would we want to take the Abenaki bill in? I think we're hoping you don't want to. Uh, we don't want to. It, there's $35,000 impact. Uh, this is free licenses for hunting and fishing. Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm yeah. If we're you're being okay shut with down. It. I just told the Lewis Porter, I don't know what with the Act 250 bill, did we want to take it in? Well, that's different. We told him that's we're being shut down. Talk to the pro tem unless he wants us to take it in. We're not going to take it in. Okay. Well, there is something in there that affects the revenues of the state. Right. Yeah. That's the question. Otherwise, I mean, the, I know the Abenaki uh, tribe would really like us to be able, and I know the pro tem's office and others would like this to go. And if, if you don't want to take it in, we can just bring it to- Has it been referred to us? Uh, not yet. We could vote it in and out. I mean- Let's sure, see if I, we can, I can email, let's see if we can fit if, let's see if we can I'll, I'll fit email it in this afternoon just so someone can tell us 
in sure. 30 seconds what it is, and then we can that. decide if we want to take it. All right, let's get okay. on to this one. We got to finish this one. I it's think on changing the as I look at it. Somebody on the floor is going to say, shouldn't this be referred to the Committee on Finance because it affects the revenues of the state? I think so that's, we what, will, uh, so that's what I'm that saying in the right now. Man, so we man will chair. see if we can get man someone chair. to come in later this afternoon and tell us. Right now, we're going to go finish this one. Madam Chair. Yeah, who, who is saying that? McDonald. Ah, OK. I can't see people. So I got. Madam Chair. Four, the, yes. We might consider when we come in this afternoon to someone to make a motion to suspend the rules not to send the Apodaki bill to finance. Okay, we could do that. Okay, what I may be, I'm, 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 I, what's I'm concerning I'm me and the pro tem's office can deal with it okay. is Go there might be stuff. some people who would like to see it sent to us, and there, and I think we should know that. Can, can we deal with a $35,000 yes. question after we finish after. the million dollar question? Yep. Yes. Yep. All right. So I think we've got some fine tuning of the wording maybe, but I think, Maria, if you put that back up, we've got it. Program is in the service charge of immunity. Just working on it now. Uh, okay, that's it. That's the, yeah. Uh, commissioner shall notify the affected communication union district and uh, allow um, and right, while Maria is typing that, and I don't know if she can block us out, the next question was, did we want to put any up to's on this? Yeah, so for example, up, what do you mean exactly? Well, we just said there's 17,000 so much money. And we said, and these are all the projects that the, can, it can be spent on. We have the other body gave a certain amount to each project or section. They gave a line extension, connectivity initiatives, broadband lifeline program. Um, we have not done that. Uh, it has been suggested we might want to put some up to's on there. I, at this point, I don't know how we'd start. I mean, what are we, are we afraid all the money would go in line extensions to wealthy communities? Because they no. can get their act together really fast. No, we're afraid that line extensions would go to poor communities that were not fiber, not fiber extensions. Oh, something, as I was thinking yesterday, the commissioner said they put out notices and it was on their website. But when you're putting out notices of how to get attached on your website, you don't have a website. We need to find a way, probably through the schools, to send home with their children um, some kind of a notice that you should call <laughs> or check in, uh, probably call, uh, to find out how you could get assistance in getting a, you know, tied in with broadband. Because wealthy communities are watching this. They may be watching it on YouTube right now. Poorer communities are out working in grocery stores and are probably not watching this. And how do we let them know? And if to start with, all of the neighbor, you know, the folks that are five miles, ten miles, whatever miles out from Montpelier, or you know, 
start coming in and the money is going out very quickly to line extensions, do we want to say no, that, you know, up to can go there and then Again, if nothing comes in on the other ones, we don't want, I'd rather get 2000 people hooked up on line extensions because no one feels they can get fiber to the home out in the time frame we've got. Why don't we give it some shot? And then yep. if you, if it made you more comfortable, we could subject it to change from uh, approval of Jai talk or something. Well, that, do we run into the same, I think we run into the same problem we had before. If we set this as a limit, Jai talk can't change the law. Um, this is also a question of timing. You know, we're in, we're in such a tight time frame. If we're gonna get anything done, we can't have you know two or three weeks of lapse before a committee goes and decides and then sends it to someone else. The purpose of this was was really limited to preventing a CUD that's not going to be up and running for for two years from preventing Jane from getting her schoolwork, you know, which right. he can get right away from a cable line or Joe from sure. getting his telehealth right now because it's available. Sure, sure. That's that that purpose of this. We're talking about two different things, I think. We, we all feel like we've softened the veto power, but we're getting a check-in from the CUDs. The, the chair I thought was yeah. talking about, do we create some up to numbers in the yeah. connectivity, in the line extension, in all of that? There had been- This that is Birnbaum's suggestion, if, Michael Birnbaum. Madam Chair? Yes. If I, if I may. Uh, I would suggest the following. I, I heard a concern also about uh, publicizing. I think that's yeah. how we got to talking about our concerns about which communities were going to get this funding. I think one of the things that we have learned so far in the COVID emergency is that we, we have learned how to broadly communicate by pushing a message out, not just through the website, but also through Front Porch Forum, for instance, through community action groups, uh, through the schools, the superintendents association yeah, and the like. And frankly, uh, the legislators can be of help here too in reaching out through their newsletters and the like. So I, I'm feeling pretty good about our ability to get word out about the resource. And when it comes to ensuring that they go where, where you most want them to go, these resources, um, I think you've been very clear about your concern for uh, helping the, the folks who are not as well resourced. And uh, certainly this commission understands that. The department has a fair amount of knowledge about uh, the economic uh, circumstances in the state, who needs what where. And certainly we have the benefit also of um, access to our, um, you know, our, our agency of human services uh, outlets and also the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. So I, I think we're pretty well positioned um, across these agencies to exercise some good judgment here if you've given the guidance, which I think you have, namely that you, you want to ensure these funds, you know, to, uh, you, you tell me what the standard is, greatest extent possible, reasonably, whatever words you choose, go to uh, communities that, or folks in communities who have great need. Can we, I, if you get 2,000 requests for line extensions, all right, yeah. from not real underserved communities, all right, these are served, it's just, I got a hundred of them within 10 miles of the state house where the line comes to this side of the hill and that side of the hill and the five people on the hill can't get hooked up. Um, and I want to get them hooked up. And they will, I'm quite sure, if there's enough money to cover the cost, 
apply and get hooked up. What do they get the question, hooked up to, Madam Chair? The, the In, cable is what's generally okay. there. Maybe and I fiber. would say no. I would say no, don't do that. You're going to tell my constituents they can't, they have to run on 5 1 dial up? Madam Chair, if Greensboro has fiber and there are poor people there, I'd hook them up. If my town of Williamstown doesn't have fiber, I would not hook up my people in Williamstown to cable. Because once you do that, no one who wants to be engaged in business is going to move to Williamstown. Okay. They're not going to move there because we did a short term such and such. They're going to All move right. to Greenboro if they want to do business because they have the resources because it has fiber. But they're not coming to Williamstown. And if we hook people up in Williamstown and make them happy right now. This is this up, is not we are running screwed. a town, we are Senator. Years. Senator, this is not running a town. I see you, Senator Pearson. This is a town that is hooked up. And it is allowing the school children in that town who happen to live a mile out from the last poll to access broadband. That is the purpose of this money. This is not our money. Okay. I would hook them up if they can if if they can get broadband by hooking them up to fiber, do it. Your CUD will say, will have a say. Sandra Pearson. Maria, can you remind us that the the House uh, didn't have up to numbers, but they did assign uh, buckets. Yeah. So this this line extension, what was their amount there? I believe that was two million. Yeah, it wasn't a lot. Would it make sense for us to say up to two million? And that way, we're pushing much more of it through the connectivity. Yeah. Parameter. Say up to, up to two yeah. there. We will be back here. Um, right. If it's if it's going disastrously with the rest of the money. If the two million's gone away by August sixteenth, and a large number of people are being told, "Sorry, the money's gone," we're going to start to get emails, um, and then we can look at how the other, the applications for the other buckets of money are going and make a decision at that point. Does that work? Yeah. The other question had come to us around fixed wireless, but do, you know, did we want to make sure the rest of it didn't go there? Um, and I don't, I don't have strong feelings, but that was the other one that was strongly, you know, you know, that we were encouraged to make sure there was a little, um, a little bit of a parameter around. Yeah, my only concern with fixed wireless, my my one thing that it's good at is that it can get service out quickly to very underserved areas. Sure. And, and it does, it's, it's such poor service that it's not gonna undercut the folks coming later that from deciding to get hooked up to fiber if and when fiber ever gets out okay. that last mile. Plus we, we did require to have a fiber backhaul if I recall, so. Yeah, so, we did. So are people, is this all of the up toing that we wanna do? I okay. take silence as a as a yes vote. Yeah. Fine. Yes vote or either they've all gone to sleep. Okay. Let's keep moving. Wait, wait. I saw magenta going by. Yeah, I think we did that already. Did magenta already, okay. This was yeah, this was just the fiber installations within fiber networks. Okay. So I think um I think you've already addressed the economically challenged households or communities. Yeah. This, hopefully we can just read through this. Hopefully this reflects what Senator Brock had suggested earlier about the CUD. There's input. A, so, Maria, there's a typo on 16. Line 16. Oh. The award. Yep. 
So the proposed project under the program is in the service territory of a CUD. Immediately upon receipt of the application for the proposed project, the commissioner shall notify the affected CUD of the proposed, proposed project and provide seven calendar days for the district to raise an objection to the project. The commissioner may award funding to the proposed project over the objection of a communications union district provided he or she documents in writing the reasons for overriding the objection. That captures what I asked for, yes. Yeah, I think that's Very good. Well. Great. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, let's go. Uh, okay, so I think we need to do some amending here. Um, but so far, I, I think you want, and it's okay, obviously, to have monthly reports to Jai Talk Finance and Energy and Technology getting status reports. Now here's where uh, the house has raised uh, an objection to some of the role. Now we fix that in which JITOC and, and, and joint fiscal doesn't have the ability to do anything. So that part's been fixed. And I'm right now going back and forth uh, in text with, uh, with Chairman Briglin, what he wanted to do was delete everything after uh, the date, December 20, 2020 and delete everything after that. Uh, I just went back to him and said, yeah, but there's no ability to do anything other than recommend. Do you want to prevent JTOC from recommending anything? So I'm waiting for him to answer that question. Okay, you want to, we'll just go on for now, maybe revisit now. Okay. Back. Okay, so I don't know that we actually spoke about these sections. Um, these were just some additional considerations. Um, Senator Pearson had brought up. So one in subsection O, just clarifying that any personal information submitted under the program is confidential and exempt from disclosure under the Public Records Act. Such information may only be disclosed publicly in an anonymized and aggregated format. Okay. So this might be health or income information. Yeah. Then subsection he just specifies that the program sunsets on January 1st, um, but that the department shall be the successor in interest to any remaining rights, liabilities, and obligations. So if there are any loose ends um, after the program is no longer in operation, that the department is authorized um, to act accordingly. And then I don't think you had actually really talked about yet or address this issue of what role might there be for the existing telecommunications and connectivity advisory board, which under statute uh, right now reviews and makes non-binding recommendations about any grants under the connectivity initiative. So Presumably, because some of the funding is going out in grants through the connectivity initiative, this board would have a role. Um, but I don't know if you want to clarify that or, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, but is, is there. Senator Pearson, did this come from you? Uh, yeah, the first two were were Maria's. Those I, yeah, those I understand. Yeah, the the telecommunications connectivity advisory board does already have these uh, review authority over money that goes out through the connectivity fund. And so it came up as, do we mean to have them in two? I, I, I can't see why we wouldn't. This is not slowing things down because it's a non-binding approval authority, but it is another set of eyes. It's, it's a professional, the board's made up of other folks in the administration and some citizens. So I, I didn't see any harm and it was just sort of making it clear. How, how often do they meet or is it? I believe they meet monthly. Monthly? Well, the House has raised a, a question, a flash objection to this entry uh, because their, their concern was, well, would this in fact slow things down? In other words, would that review be done prior to uh, the awarding of a grant under the program, thereby sh slowing down the awards process. And then they also just didn't understand why we wanted to do this. Well, I, I put it this way, if we don't want this, we should be explicit about that because I think 
they were basically included in the last draft without being articulated. And so- uh, Well, I, they do under the connectivity fund, but that's, the, that's a specific state connectivity fund that is funded with the universal service charge. You're right. You're right, Senator Cummings. But this is, they actually do the connectivity initiative at grant program. Oh, okay. These federal but, dollars, some of them going through the connectivity initiative. So. Well, I guess what you could say is the board shall have post award review and non binding approval, something like that. Yeah, or make it clear that they're not an intermediary. <laughs> I mean, I, I, or we can say, well, that that makes it. I don't want this to slow them down. I kind of like the idea of them being engaged, but but I don't want it to slow down. So we should, unless people, I yeah, mean, unless they like can longer. meet on an emergency. I mean, this is going to be a couple months. If yeah, if they meet an emergency basis, it'll affect the revenues of the state or something. Madam and Chair, you have to meet on an emergency basis every time you have you know a project to approve. Commissioner, I thought uh, it might be helpful if um, if perhaps Clay could give us a little description of what the process is now so that you have some idea of what this review through the telecommunications advisory board entails. Because again, we have a six, seven month window here. And no, I, I, go ahead, Clay. Madam Chair, I, I do think um, uh, some there's some valid concern here about timing. Um, the board meets monthly. Um, I think that if you wanted to have uh, the PCAP review these projects, we would just have to have set a regular schedule like every two weeks or something, um, at, at least through the rest of the summer, just to make sure that they meet regularly and in, in, in review projects. We generally, uh, when we get the uh, responses to our RFP and we select the proposals we want um, and we provide all of the materials uh, to the TCAB to uh, review uh, and give us our input. And the input's been valuable in the past. Um, so um, I, I, would, um, I, I would prefer to have their input than not have it. Uh, but uh, it does require them to meet and we have a quorum and um, you know, typical board stuff that, um, you know, would have the potential to delay uh, our announcement of awards if, um, if, if they didn't meet uh, weekly or biweekly. Well, again, it's, it's, just, it's just a delay factor. And, you know, this, this whole thing is, is a house of cards as far as time is concerned. It's so really what, tight. Today, when you you have to get their approval for other awards, or you just get their advice. Uh, we 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 get we have to get their advice. I think before moving ahead, um, and we've never had a timing issue like this before. So, um, you know, it, it, it we we wait for it. Um, I think if you're concerned about time, what Senator Brock has uh, brought up. Um, as a suggestion uh, would probably be the preferable way to do it. Um, if they have strong objections to something, we ought to know about it, but. Right. Um, yeah, what if you notify them yeah. of it? And, and that way there's sort of another set of eyes, but yeah. could we do that, Maria? Yeah, let's. Um... They have strong objections. They can notify the commissioner within three working days. When it comes in, send it out. In the commissioner, does that seem like that uh, is could be an option of workable? I'm just thinking we, we had a meeting today with uh, with this board and one of the issues that came up is they very much want to um, be able to give the legislature their thoughts on this bill in the entirety and so they were thinking about working on a document through Google Docs and then meeting on Monday next week 
to come to agreement and there were um, open meeting law questions that came up. And this is an area of law that I'm not well versed in. So what occurred to me in listening to your conversation was if, if the last suggestion is possible, can that be done without running afoul of open meetings? Because it certainly um, means a great deal to me when I get a letter like that from an, an advisory board like that to give full effect to, to the meaning of the law that they're advising the commissioner, I have to pay attention. So um, I'm happy to get a letter from them within three days. I just don't know whether they can do that on an advisory basis without running afoul of open meetings. Somebody else would have to speak to that. I, I think we just, the commissioner shall provide notice or shall notify of pending grants and 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 then um trust they'll let you know as individuals yeah, or you need to say the dates or whatever um if they're red you know i i we're such we're so stuck here but yeah we are we have a six month window that that we have to move this through and i right. think uh yeah. We're, not, we're just not going to be able to hit all the marks. Just period, Maria. That's it. Okay. All right. I think we solved that last problem. Thank you. Let's keep going. Do you want that last sentence there? The commissioner shall so authority or just take that out? All right. I don't think it's necessary. They, the, the, the advisory board has its power. We're kind of looping them in, but we're, uh, we're, we're making sure they're not a uh, barricade to moving forward. Okay. Senator McDonald, are you trying to say something? Um, I can't see you, Senator McDonald. You'll have to holler. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, did, I, did, I didn't catch the request. Oh, sorry. Yeah. All right. So how much further have we got to go on this so we can get it to Jane? Well, going back to uh, the conversations with uh, the House Committee, mm -hmm. uh, if you go to page five, line five, backwards and it's subparagraph G uh, they had a bit of a problem with the last part of that regarding priority being given to 100 100 because they said well this this and, and to fix wireless served by power to buy call they said that this really uh, paragraph really relates to con a connectivity initiative that doesn't quite make sense the way it's worded uh, I frankly don't really understand the full nature of their concern, but they would be satisfied if uh, on the third line of G, after the word, however, we inserted the language, if uh, or when the technology is feasible, comma, priority shall be given, and that will satisfy their concern. All right. Uh, Easy enough. Sounds good. And Let's see. Uh, they did again have the same question on on the tech, uh, tech, technicom uh, continuity board because of the concern about it, thereby creating a delay. Yeah. Uh, we dealt with the uh, CUD information, which was uh, being informed, which was their biggest objection. And I haven't heard anything else from them at this point. Uh, I sent uh, the latest stuff that we've done uh, over to uh, to him and waiting for him to get back to me and. If I have the draft that we get finished from Maria, I will send that over as well. And hopefully we're, we're, we're pretty much in agreement. Well, we're about three hours late getting the, and I think some of this fine tuning may get done in approps, but I'd rather it get done here. But they wanted this at noon. Um, Do you want to walk no, the other? So, but we all want things, right? 
Did you just want to confirm the other programs, um, the telehealth and the CUD planning, or you're good with that? Has everyone reviewed yeah, that? Yeah, we already? haven't taken any testimony on that. Um, so just to, so you know it's here, and if you want to discuss it, no problem. But this section two, this is the 800,000 for the CUDs and their planning um, efforts. And I think you spoke about that. No um, then uh, the telecom, the 10-year telecom recovery plan, the $500,000 uh, for that work to be done now. Uh, the only other thing I'll just bring your attention to is because there's going to be this sort of interim recovery plan, you'll see section four there just pushes out the deadline. Um, for the, the next telecom plan, which was scheduled to be submitted in December. Oh, by December. All and right. Pushed out to we'll see on line 16, okay. June 30th of next year. And then similarly, the next plan after that, three years after that, is June 30th. So that's okay. uh, it's on a three year cycle. All right. And then the telehealth connectivity program, I think you've heard a lot from VPQHC. I've just stricken the findings here because appropriations is asking that all findings be taken out and put in a memo that they're gonna have accompanying all of their bills. But the substance is what was so far, what we have here is what's the house proposed that's $800,000 to VPQHC. And this is a, project that they're already working on, a pilot pros proposal, the connectivity care for packages, which basically just gets devices um, and training, outreach, digital literacy training out to patients and providers. Um, and then, and they do report back January 15th of next year. And then the last kind of broadband-ish program uh, is funding for PEG access, the access media organizations. And the proposed amount is about $460,000. So that's kind of the whole suite of broadband proposals that appropriations is expecting. They're gonna look at those too. Well, they're, yep. And they're looking at, this all falls within the $20 million uh, approved appropriation. Okay. Committee, are we ready to let the editors look at this and send it over? One more question uh, that I just got from the House again. Okay. Uh, and that goes back to uh, what we're talking about, JTOC and its ability to recommend changes. You remember we took out the notion of recommending to joint fiscal make changes and we yep. soften it. Now, uh, basically what they're saying is joint fiscal can't alter a program's requirements. So JTOC should recommend waiving requirements. Uh, one of the things that uh, to satisfy them, and I don't know if we want to go that far, is if we take a look at page six, line 16, of taking all the language after the date, December 20, 2020, and delete it. That's page seven. Just delete it all. We still have JITOC in its oversight role. We're just not specific upon what it's supposed to do and what it's supposed to report. However, yeah. we say that it's being reported to them. And if JTOC is there, you know, it's going to do what it's going to do. I, and I, I trust, given the makeup of JTOC, that if there's a whole lot of money not going out the door, the Appropriations Committee may say, wait a minute, we need to do that. We, I, who, I don't know, who is on the House? Anyone in, from the money chairs on the House side on that? I'm not aware of anybody from Appropriations on the House side. Are you, are you Chris? No. All right. I thought Representative Feltis was on JITOC. Oh, that's right, she is. You're right, Marty Feltis okay. is. Okay, yeah, so right. we've got we've got a couple folks on there. So if the reports are coming in that the money's not going out the door, 
I think we can trust the appropriations committee to say we're going to alter this appropriation. Yeah, I, I think I think that's fair. Yeah, and they will. They may actually alter this language if they have a better way of of doing it. Okay. And, Shall we strike this language then? Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait, say, wait no. Say that again. I. So I thought the proposal was to strike the language after the December 20th date. Right. And I think the issue is that JTOC nor joint fiscal has the legal power to alter or give a waiver to a legislative standard or rule or law. They don't have the power to, to waive the law. I mean, in theory, you could have JTOC submit representation, recommendations to the committees of jurisdiction. But again, I, I just don't even know if the language is necessary because that's what we're going to do anyway. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think it's belts and suspenders. All right, there it goes, all right. Uh. And we'll let the, the emer yeah, the, the probes are gonna decide where they want unexpended funds to go and when. All right. Okay, uh, and so did you wanna, okay, that was the last issue. Um, any unexpended funds as of October? You wanted to add some language there or leave that? I got to believe that in August, the, they will empower the e-board some kind of, some, some holy smokes, this needs to do this power. But, but I guess we could ask Maria just to approach, make sure that uh, Approps is sort of understands what we're trying to do and maybe they have a more thorough approach. Well, I will drop an email to the chair and tell her this is our concern. We're having trouble figuring out what the legal pathway is, but if the money's not going out the door by the end of October, and praise God, we're not in session the end of October. Um, how do we get that money back into the pile and reallocated? And we that's let's ask and let's them figure that out. But they don't want. The only thing that I'm hearing is that you might want to have the uh, an October trigger as opposed to just the generic December 20th for all other CRF funds. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. Because right now all of the all CRF funds unexpended as of December 20th come back to the state fund. And All right, cuz I was going to say but yeah, December 20th they're really for all practicality is no state corona relief fund because yeah, that the, money all has to be spent in the next 10 days. So I don't know enough to know the about issue. what the plan is about whether it goes into the UI fund or what, but I, there is a there is a lot of thinking, I just don't know what exactly it is, of, to reallocate that money before December 30th, which is the yes. actual uh, Ah, so, so let's this, put as of December, yeah, they're going to reallocate it. I know no they're one wants to send it back. And I've heard UI is the one safe place because they're going to need all the help they can get. What if we um, just say, th th this is unusual though, because um, we, we are sort of contemplating the money getting up against a deadline and not getting out. Right. Whereas the business stuff is, is I don't know. It's a little bit different because you could write yeah. a check to a business on December 1st. So what yeah, if we just had November 15th, any unspent money goes to ACCD and that way they have a little bit um, 
well, I of think, time to push yeah, it out into business relief as opposed to the last fail safe is into the UI fund. Well, I don't, what are the, the state coronavirus relief fund is where all this money is being kept. And I'm assuming that it would be considered in, yeah, that they could go to joint fiscal for permission to expend it. Let's just flag this one, put November in there and flag it to send, you know, with a note saying we're not sure what the the proper way to make sure unexpended funds get back in a way you know in in a timely fashion so they can be reallocated okay i think it was anticipated that they they do have a plan as of december 20th what to do i just don't know what it is but that's all of this yeah year. yeah okay there's a reversion provision in every. Well, let's just just leave this then, and let the let appropriations put the. Okay. And we can always send them a note saying this amount of money has not gone out. It's the end of October. We don't think it's going out. Okay. We might be able to get. A, you know, permission to do a committee meeting. Um, we could say we shall meet, but they might not like that. But um, there's a practical can, matter. What are we going to do on December the 20th if it goes that it, late? Yeah. October, maybe. I'm confident that a probes is figuring this out with a lot of yep. programs. I think they are too. I am, uh, yeah. yeah. Aware of it. December 20th, I don't think there's any option, but the UI fund, we're talking about money. There's, there's not enough money. So I don't think we want to be sitting on it when we've got some businesses going belly up. Yeah. Okay. Are we ready? I don't even know if this needs to get proofed because it'll get proofed when they put it all together, right? Uh, I, I mean, it certainly can be if you'd like it to be, but no, it will go through the editors eventually. Before final, okay. So a recommittee, this isn't a bill. Can we do a thumbs up, thumbs down? Are we ready to send this to? I think we're ready, Madam Chair. Yep. Ready? Is anyone not ready? Okay, I'm not, I'm not seeing any no's. All right, I got a thumbs up, thumbs up. Okay, we're good. All right, so this is being sent over by this committee. Um, for then, you could forward us copies of the, the final, that would be helpful. Yeah, just make sure we all get it. And then if somebody goes, oh, we can let the, uh, I, but I'm sure there's also feedback coming in from the house. I think the goal is this is gonna come out of there today and hit the floor if we're going home tomorrow. <laughs> um, but I think we're gonna be on the floor probably all day tomorrow and then see where it goes. Okay, so let's get that to them. Okay. And then uh, I think I've gotten a couple inquiries about that farm housing um, that we haven't done. And let's see if there's anything else on Good, here I'm missing. Yes. Chair, do you want us to be ready on your amendment on missed tax? Um, well, that's the question. Yeah, Abby, I'm trying to make sure we don't have. Okay. And they're coming, so you want me to get here? This is Thursday, right? Okay. Would you like me to gather Doug Farnham and Abby Shepard for this conversation? Abby would be good. I. 
I have not seen, I think Abby may have sent over a copy. I just. Let me get gather them for you. Yes, let's get everyone gathered. Let me see if I can find. I think it came just as we got off the floor. Okay, there it is. Senator Campion did, uh, or McDonald did, did you approve the Abnaki fishing license bill? Is that why you brought we, it up? We voted it, excuse me, we voted it out 500 this morning. Yeah, I think about noontime, because that's when the phone call came in. Right. Just as we were trying to vote. You're muted, Mark. That's fine. Some things I wouldn't mind retaining after we're back. <laughs> I wouldn't either. <laughs> <laughs> I think he figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I texted the pro temps assistant to see whether we could get a, a heads up on whether or not we ourselves might choose to suspend the rules to not have it sent to us. And that would certainly send a signal and, um, and, um, the Abenaki bill. And we'll put it right on, a, you know, okay. put, Who, we'll put it on notice. We'll let's get let's deal meeting. with this while we're dealing with this. Sure. Um, who is the drafter on the Abenaki bill? Ellen Chukowski. Okay, let's see if Ellen can join us and just tell us what the Abenaki bill is. Oh, wait, everybody's leaving me? No, we're here. Oh. That was the okay. commissioner. The commissioner. Oh, we're saying goodbye to the commissioner. Thank you, commissioner. We're, obli we're obligated to you, Madam Chair. Okay. Then yeah. we Madam will... Chair, if you'd like, I can tell you what's in the Abenaki bill, but if you no, want to... No, I want to have the drafter tell us what's there that we need to know. Then when it comes up, I've not got someone getting up on the floor saying, how come the finance committee isn't yeah, looking yeah. at this? All right. Great, great idea. Thank you. Okay. So Faith, if you can see if Ellen can join us and win. My God, we got a whole hour. All right. Has the committee gotten this amendment to section eight? Do you have copies of that? Which bill? Senator Cummings has contacted Abby and Doug to see if they can join us now, and Ellen and Dan Dickerson to also see if they can join us now, and I'll let you know when I hear from people. Okay. Thank you, Faith. This is to settle the issue with the 954 and the safe harbor tax. I really don't want to get up and speak against the committee. I take unwritten rules very seriously. I also take being truthful with the public very seriously. And I can't put out a table I know isn't reflecting the truth. This will, I believe, kick the decision, close, go away, down the road What? And Doug Farnham has just joined us. If Doug has joined us. I know you can't send the email. It's not an email. I don't want to send it. I want it to go away. All right. Now it's not going to go away. All right. My computer is doing... Senator Cummings, Ellen Tchaikowski has just joined us. I don't know if you want to stay on 9. I, I want to do this first. Ellen will be with you shortly. All right. Now I'm back where I am. Okay. This safe harbor, and at, is Abby with us? She is not. Because I am just... 
All right, what this says is before next January, there'll be this report given to us by the tax department doing a little further research into this tax bill. I will agree to this, but my intent is to have it taken up before we adjourn CNA DA because the tax department has to get out their tax forms. And I want to make sure they have time to do that. When is that, Madam Chair? Senator Cummings, Abby Shepard is just. Okay, going. Abby, can you, we're looking at the amendment that you drafted. Bill number? It's 954. Thank you. This is the amendment to section eight, the safe harbor bill. Okay, Abby, can you tell us, walk us through this? Could we see it maybe? Sure, I can share the content. It's not on the website, is it? It is not. I haven't been asked to post it. Okay. Post it. I'll post it now. Okay. Things are moving too fast. Miscellaneous tax bill, right, Madam Chair? Yes. No. Thank you. They can sense your weakness, Abby. They know, as well as cats. Sorry. As Not to worry, my grandkids will be in masks and all from day camp, waiting for pickup. Why we close day camp at 4.30 when parents get out of work at five, I don't know, but we do. So let's go. Okay, so this, uh, just to confirm, this is the amendment that I emailed you earlier today, Madam Chair. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. You got so you doing been, that many amendments too. I will start uh, sharing my screen in just a moment. Okay. Speaking of while well, she's doing that, um, See, see, yeah, knowing your weakness. I had a dog who was the smartest, most alpha dog I've ever seen. I got on the phone one day and I had a bag of fiber fill you'd stuff things with. He looked me in the eye, went over, grabbed the bag of fiber fill, which was about two feet high, and proceeded to empty it piece by piece all over the floor all the time watching me and he knew I couldn't get loose. <laughs> what kind of dog was it? It looked like a mini German Shepherd. Uh -huh. It was a Nazi. <laughs> yeah, understood barter. You you to get to get you take the TV thing, the uh -huh. TV remote and wave it in front of you to see if you'd pay attention. Okay. Um, can the committee see my screen and hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. And I apologize okay. for the voices in the background. That's um, fine. So this, uh, if you'd like, I can walk you through. It's it's fairly brief. Yep. Um, so this is a an amendment um, under Senator Cummings' name that would strike out the um, action that was taken yesterday, which deleted Section Eight, the use tax safe harbor provision. It adds in instead a report um, required on or before January 15th of next year by the Department of Taxes with the assistance of JFO, um, a report about the remittance of the Vermont use tax that is uh, reported on individual income tax returns. 
Um, the report, and I apologize, I do have an edited version which I can share. It That's has okay. the punctuation. This was drafted fairly quickly. Um, so this report would require the department to analyze the fiscal impact on the remittance of the use tax um, on personal income tax returns, the impact that was caused by the passage of South Dakota v. Wayfair, the U.S. Supreme Court decision, um, which triggered the Vermont um, the conforming or corresponding Vermont remote seller collection requirements. And then it has the site to the section that imposes those. That's the preceding um, preceding 12 month period and $100,000 of transactions or uh, a number of transactions. It also requires an analysis um, related to the marketplace facilitator collection requirements that went into effect last year. Um, so it looks at, it requires an um, analysis of both of those and as well recommending options either for reducing the amount of the calculation or for other amendments um, such as what were proposed this year, adding in the use tax table to statute or uh, reducing the amount, which is currently 0.1% uh, percent, uh, percent of AGI. So I do actually have an updated version that I can share. It's just some slight editing tweaks to make that a little bit clearer. Okay. I, I think though the, um, this is being looked at, I think as a compromise, I would like, I will take down my amendment, which deletes section. The second amendment, the, our second amendment to the bill, which deletes section eight, and I will submit this as an alternative, but I would like the committee to sign on to it so that this is, in fact, a bill the committee has sure. you know, agreed to, and yep. then we can, uh, you know, at, at least like a good portion of the committee on there with me. And so um, I will lead. All right, I see a thumbs that. up with Senator Brock and Senator McDonald. Anybody else? Yep. Senator Ballant, Senator Campion. Okay. Anyone else? Pearson. Okay. All right. So Rock in going once. Going oh, okay. Oh, okay. Painful, but he's got his thumb up. All right. So I can say I'm I'm going to submit this on the behalf of the committee. And quicker calls. It was approved seven zero. Okay. Well, we and can't do a committee a bill, but yeah. All right. And it'll be a substitute for the calendar member. Yeah, and I am going to get on my email, Abby. Can you email that the edited to Secretary Bloomer? And I will right now um, let John know and Peter Sterling what we're doing. Okay. All right. Then we, and I guess Ellen is here. Senator Cummings, Dan Dickerson is here, who also wrote this. Dan is policy. here. This is 954, right? Okay, thank you, committee. I think we can move forward. Doug. You're here. Does this work for you now that we voted? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Um, so Doug Farnham, Tax Department. The one thing you said before the vote was about timing. And um, I want to make sure you have time to get tax forms done. So, so speaking, <laughs> we ha try to have solid drafts in November um, for the vendors. I think the biggest kink here is making sure that the vendors that produce the tax software have enough time to make any adjustments um, 
changing, you know, the instructions, the percentage on our, on our, on our, on our own forms isn't that bad, but it's, it's the computer programming that they have to do in the preparation software that is the timing challenge. Um, so the delivery date of January 15th, when we usually have our forms, um, you know, in a normal year, uh, where we start taking returns around January 20th. Um, yeah. No, my, my intent is we're going to get this out when we come back in August so that, you know, August, September in that time frame, so that if any changes are necessary, you have time to make them. Okay. Right. So Madam Chair, then the, the, the date in the amendment is January 15th, but the expectation from the committee would be delivery of the report in August. I think so. Be ready to, yeah, the best you can do. When, I'm not going to wait till January because I know those tax forms are out well before that. But I think this okay. just gives more time to get a little more succinct analysis and uh, look at, you know, we, we tended to look at a million dollar hit but didn't look at the million dollar gain on the other side and just, just a little more, I think, organized and united analysis for us. All right. Right. Uh, I certainly, the department doesn't have a problem with that. We can um, okay. try to have as much pre preliminary analysis ready in August as we can. I was looking at some of our statistics in, uh, in, Sorry, do I have time to talk for a little bit or are you uh, needing to switch to broadband? No, we did broadband. We've got to get to Abenaki fishing rights. Okay. And we have about a half hour to do that. Um, so, but I've got to get this out. Okay. Secretary so, Bloomer. Very, very briefly then. Um, Historically, over 1%, about 91% of our use tax has come in by the month of August. So we should have enough of the 2000 tax year 2019 returns to turn around some updated information in August. In addition to these other analysis factors you've requested. Yes, Madam Chair. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, Ellen, are you with us? Yep. No. Yes. Yes. Okay, there you are. I'm looking at the names. Okay, you want to start and maybe we'll get this committee a little break. Um, Ellen, Madam Chair, may I just ask Ellen a quick question? Ellen, did you send me a copy of that bill for the Senate Secretary? So, I didn't send you one because you the Senate Natural Resources Committee didn't make any changes. You're just concurring right. with the House. Okay, so, so sure I can just let, I'll just let the Senate Secretary know that. Thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not actually sure from a procedure standpoint, if you need anything, because you guys didn't make any changes to it. Um, so the, uh, H716 is very short. It is an act relating to Abenaki hunting and fishing licenses. It's on your screen and, uh, it adds in the, uh, title 10, license section, uh, we add a section that allows certified citizens of a Native American Indian tribe that has been recognized by the state pursuant to one BSA chapter 23 may receive a free permanent fishing license, or if the person qualifies for a hunting license, a free permanent combination hunting and fishing license upon the submission of a current and valid tribal identification card. 
So members of the state recognized tribes that have their valid um, tribal ID cards can apply for a free uh, combination hunting and fishing license. Uh, they have to meet the qualifications for a hunting license, which includes uh, passing a hunter safety course. So we're not, um, we're not changing anything. They still have to follow the existing hunting laws and regulations. Uh, the, there's also a report. So we're asking the commissioner of fish and wildlife to report back after three years, how many of these licenses were issued. And then it takes effect on January 1, 2021. Was there a fiscal note with this? Yes. Okay. Do you know what that was? Um, yes, Dan drafted it. I don't know if he Dan wants is to. Here. Ah, there's Dan. Dan. Hi, Dan. Okay. Dan. Hello. Yes. Uh, yeah. Let me oh, I, um, Faith, can you put up the fiscal note? Dan, I've made you co-host. I'm trying to do a few things. Can you do that? Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, They've got me running. Uh, why is it not? I don't want to do that. Sorry, I'm for some reason this is not working for me yet. Dan, I'll, I'll do it. Okay. Okay, Thanks, Faith. Sorry, I, I can get it to work. Um, so the fiscal, there, there are two main revenue streams that would be impacted um, by passage of the bill. Uh, one being uh, the stream that, that funds the operations of um, the Fish and Wildlife Department, and that comes primarily from the sales of the annual and the five-year hunting and fishing licenses. Um, and so I, you know, I basically did an analysis um, from the number of members that are in one of the four recognized tribes. And then based on, you know, the, the total number of Vermonters that typically buy these licenses um, and applied that to those, uh, that smaller cohort. And I estimated that it would um, result in a loss of roughly 30 to 35,000 annually, um, starting in FY21. Um, and then the second stream is is the sale of lifetime licenses, um, which I did estimate that there would be a few of those that you know would have happened normally, but now because um, individuals are eligible for the the permanent license through this bill, they wouldn't buy those licenses. Um, that money goes to uh, a trust fund that um, I think collects interest and, and the Fish and Wildlife Department can use it for, I think, land purchases or, or for big purchases. Um, you know, uh, I'm not positive of, of everything. I think, yeah. I think it's potentially land and other things. Um, and so that would be about five to 10,000 annually. Um, so in total, it's, you know, 35 to 45,000 of lost revenue um, from those two sources. The question. Committee. Question. Yes. Yeah. Senator um, McDonald. We've heard a lot of talk about how fishing licenses are up with folks not, um, you know, sequestered. What's the, what's the just the ballpark for those numbers? Um, I don't, I don't know off the top of my head, um, how much they're up specifically. I do know. I mean, I've I've heard the same thing. Um. You know, and I, I put a note at the end of the fiscal note sort of saying, you know, the short term trend has been that more people are buying fishing licenses, which could, you know, give the department more capacity to sort of absorb this, the cost of, of this bill. Um, but it really depends on, you know, how long the impacts of the pandemic are felt, you know, if, if um, you know, if something, if, uh, if a shot is or some sort of uh, medication um yeah. is developed you know before the end of the year then it could be shorter but if it is ongoing then I wasn't asking uh, for a prognosis just curious how much they're up okay i yeah sorry i don't know you don't know the number but they're up okay sandra pearson uh, my question is out of curiosity how does 
one, prove they are a certified member of ABNET. So, um, oh, oh, go ahead. Do you want, do you want, to, do you want me to take this? No, yes, yes. <laughs> um, so there are four tribes, uh, four state recognized tribes. They all have slightly different procedures, um, but as a tribe, member, they're all eligible to receive a tribal identification card from the tribe. So uh, the tribes do issue these cards and they can be issued at any age. Thank you. So the tribes certify who is one of them. Okay. Sandra Thank Sorotkin. Uh, can I take two minutes to tell a personal story here? Sure. Was that a yes? Yeah. Said oh, sure. okay. <laughs> So, going back 30 years, my law firm represented Homer St. Francis and the Abenakis in a fishing rights claim where they arrested him for fishing and wanted to fine him. And we spent, we represented them pro bono, essentially, over a two or three year period. And we actually won the case at the trial court level and it went to the Vermont Supreme Court. And in one of the poorest decisions I've ever seen written, it was overturned. And I, I lost a lot of faith in the judiciary with that decision because if that case had been upheld, we had flown in all these experts from, from Colorado and stuff, and it was a long, long trial. You had to show continuing presence in Franklin County and other words without interruption to be certified as a tribe, they would have had a land rights claim to about a third of the state of Vermont. And that was never going to be allowed by the people who were in power. Uh, I can get you those decisions, but they were just remarkable. And obviously, I'm strongly going to support this bill uh, because they shouldn't have had to pay for their licenses all along because I think we made a case that it was their land. So that's all I want to say. Okay. Um, so committee, do we feel any need to take this bill in? We say we reviewed it and all right. So I will text the secretary and the pro tem's office and tell them we've looked at what is this number? H seven sixteen. And could we just understand, Alan? Do, do you know if um, uh, I guess it's Fish and Wildlife? Do they think this they can just absorb this in their budget? Uh, Lewis Porter. Lewis uh, Porter did not make an issue of that before the. It was asked that question in, in um, natural resources, and his answer was no. he did not say no. We need this money in our budget. They supported the bill. That works. Thank you. Seven sixteen. Is that what we're looking at? Senator Parrott also asked us to, to find a way of raise some, raising some money for the department without actually raising some money. Okay. So this is H716. I think committee, you're going to get 20 whole minutes off. Thank you. We've done a lot today. Senator Cummings, do you plan to meet tomorrow? 
I do not have anything on the agenda, so I don't plan it. However, we all serve at the pleasure of the powers that be, so check your emails because something might get sent this way. Ellen, do you know something I don't? Uh, I apologize. I don't know what you did this afternoon, but did you get H-926, the Act 250 bill? Not that I know. We did. We get. A, we got a bill referred today. Senator Cummings, it came to us today. It came to us today, but it's but my understanding that it's being dealt with. I don't know. So we may yet. Yeah, stay okay. tuned. Okay. Stay tuned. No one has told me. They've told me we're shut down. So. Okay. And we're not going to do committee dinner. <laughs> Rock your yeah, we'll all, we've been doing committee lunch for okay. six months. Okay, because that's just my final question. Um, but if we're not, okay, thank you. Okay, well, so we aren't out of this yet. We'll see each other. Right. But the bill was referred because it does affect the revenues of the state. And I would expect that some folks are going to be asking about why, if it wasn't referred, why not? And okay. Deal with it, why not? Well, this is 716. So uh, I will oh. write. I will write an, an email asking. Um, no, I, I wasn't referring to the ad bill. I, I was referring no, to. I, I, will, I will query I that. I thought the 250 bill was referred here. Yeah, that's the bill we're talking about. Yeah, yeah it was referred. Now. We have it, I think. Yeah, but and the question is, you know, is the, if the committee doesn't do anything about it, you know, is that, it, should, should, should the judge, the, should the, the floor be waiting for a return from uh, the Senate Finance Committee of that bill, which was referred to them. I mean, I could be wrong, but I thought that, you know, the, it might get to the floor, you know, in late August, September. I, I don't know if there's a rush on it, to be honest with you. Okay. I, that's, that's I mean, that's just me. I, 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 I don't know. I hope we could meet around eight tonight. That'd be great. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. By, uh, by the way, the House approved the yield bill. Great. Oh, good. Since Senator it was their Cummings, bill, I've said so. Senator Cummings, would you like me yes. to just stop live stream? Okay, yes, we are done. We are adjourned. Go in peace.